So this session has the title, Liberation versus Assimilation, the Normalizing of Queer Art. I warned you we would have occasional etymology breaks, and so we'll have a brief pause here now for the word queer, which actually etymologically means to take an oblique angle. That's where that word came from. There's something poetically beautiful about that, to come in at an oblique angle as a kind of underneath the history of the word queer. Uh, we, I'm going to introduce our session presenter, John Imperato, in just a moment. But first, let me invite the three respondents out, and that will be Emily Devendorf, the Executive Director of Equality Michigan. Yeah. Curtis, Curtis Lipscomb, Executive Director of Kick Detroit. And Carlos Rodriguez, a cellist for the Catalyst Quartet. So after we hear from John, we're going to have, uh, as last time, 15 minutes of response from our three responders and then open it up to the audience responders. Let me tell you just a little bit about John. Uh, he worked as an actor in New York for 25 years before making the switch to producing. And in 1998, he was tapped by the Los Angeles LGBT Center to be the artistic director of its Lily Tomlin Jane Wagner Cultural Arts Center. He has also produced the debut, as I was reading this, he's basically produced the debut of every new show you would want to have produced, of Margaret Cho, Kathy Griffin, Alec Mappa, Jennifer Lewis, Carol Channing, Miss Coco Peru, Kim Coles. Uh, it goes on and on, and world premieres. He produces the Los Angeles LGBT Center's annual anniversary gala and Vanguard Awards, and his productions for the Tomlin Wagner Center have received more than 50 awards and nominations nominations. John. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yes, I am the artistic director of the Lily Tomlin Jane Wagner Cultural Arts Cultural Art Center for the Los Angeles LGBT Center. That's my 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> it is the longest title. So as we talk about the alphabet soup, the LGBT, LMNOPQ, hold the mayo. Um, I'm not going to use those letters today. I'm going to use, use the word queer. I actually like the word queer. So I think it represents the radical fairies to those who are questioning. So queer art, it was always based on the outsider perspective, right? What happens when we then become insiders? What is the importance of queer people painting, writing, producing, directing, and creating queer theater? What happens when we become so normalized that we lose our queer identity? Why is everyone writing a gay play? How do we hold on to our voice and the qualities that drove us and our art forms that were driven from sheer dint of will by being queer artists? We have a unique, a unique, unique voice that came from pain, joy, sorrow, triumph, and being marginalized, separate. We were outsiders. So how do we hold on to that voice? And what happens when a minority becomes part of the majority and we're no longer outsiders? What happens when our voice lands and falls in the hands and the mouths of the straight community? Do we run the risk of becoming the new minstrel show? Keith Haring could have never produced the art he produced. Neither could James Baldwin write Giovanni's Room, Edna St. Vincent Millay, Alice Walker, Gertrude Stein, the list goes on and on. But to be specific, Larry Kramer could have never, ever written The Normal Heart if he didn't watch a president spend more money to cure herpes and horses than AIDS and human beings the first five years of his presidency. Imagine that. Tony Kushner could have never, ever written Angels in America and Perestroika had he not understood who we were socially, economically, politically. He understood that because it's part of his DNA. Tennessee Williams wrote 13 short plays that were discovered in a suitcase about 15 years ago. The longest play, 60 Minutes, was called And They Tell Sad Stories of the Death of Queens. Now, it's a story about a very effeminate man who, if he were alive today, would be most likely transgender. He wants a boyfriend, who doesn't, and he picks up sailors. 
They move into his house. He takes care of them financially. They get comfortable. And then he presents his female persona, not drag, but his female identity of candy. Eventually, the sailor can't handle it, beats the crap out of him, and it's a very sad story of the death of queens. Now, when these plays were discovered, many theaters across the country did the plays, but they chose not to do this one. And it's, trust me, the most brilliant piece he's written in terms of those plays, and probably one of his best plays. Tennessee lived in the French Quarter inside a unit with eight apartments that housed mostly trans, gender bender, young men who had sexual identity issues. And he knew that community very well. We did that play, and we were the most um, best reviewed play of the year in Los Angeles that year. We won a ton of awards. It was a great production. Now, Tennessee wrote on the corner of her script, I will never live to see this play produced. And I'd sit in our theater and I'd go, oh my god, Tennessee, we're doing it. But look where we're doing it. At the largest LGBT center, cultural arts center on the planet, we're doing your play, your beautiful play. But why was our production successful? I believe we had a, a, a gay playwright, Tennessee, a gay director, a gay actor, a gay producer, because that play was in our DNA. I get calls constantly from writers who want to write a queer play. Mostly non, they're not queer writers, rather, who want to write a queer play. They think they can interview somebody for a couple interviews and write the play. Right now, it's all about transgender people. They are the soup du jour, flavor of the month, which drives me crazy. But they're gonna interview someone, but I get scripts, they want me to send them actors. The scripts, they're hookers with a heart of gold, not a heart of gold. And they usually get murdered or beaten up by the end of these scripts and these plays. Now, don't get me wrong, my friends. The hate crimes against transgender people are staggering. But if that's the only story you tell, it's the only story that they ever get to hear. Now, even Orange is the New Black, which I love. I'm like a crack addict for the show. And <laughs> Laverne Cox is a friend and an amazing actress. But in the second season, she's the hairdresser in the prison, if you don't know the show. All she does is go, girl, let me do your weave. Girl, let me do your color. She's been reduced to this sort of just one line is about doing hair and, and uh, doing people's color. And I thought, my God, even the second season of this show, you got it wrong. You marginalized her. You made her a stereotype. Transparent is doing an excellent job telling that story. But with TV and film, usually, but mostly with TV, what happens is what goes on the air? You go to network, you go to network producers. What goes on the air? The end result is mostly white male men determines what happens on the air. It's their voice that determines what we get to see. So I want to tell you an interesting thing that I read. Steven Spielberg said when he made The Color Purple that he was never happy with it. And he made Schindler's List. And after Schindler's List, he, as a Jewish American man, knew the atrocities and the pain of his community. But he had no business making The Color Purple. It's not a bad film, certainly not a good film. Alice Walker doesn't like it. I don't like it, but it's, I think, one of the greatest epistolary novels I've ever read. But he said that he didn't understand the story. It's a very pretty movie about slavery and emancipation. And he didn't have to tell the story of Shug Avery's love with Seeley's love. And in that book and in the movie, what happens is Seeley becomes emancipated free, financially independent, has her own business. She becomes who she is because of her love of that woman. And he said, I don't have to tell that story. And much to his credit, he said, I hope someday an African-American woman redoes this movie. Anybody know Ava DuVernay who just did Selma? She'd be perfect. But, right? She'd be perfect. But he said, that was never my story, and I never should have told it. Now, the Book of Mormon. Bear with me, my friends. I'm going to try not to go on my rant, but here goes, here goes. Written by Matt Stone and Trey Parker, two heterosexual men. I think the play is dangerous. I think it's homophobic, racist, and sexist. Now, I'll make a big grandiose statement that I'm aware of it. I think it's a major demarcation in the lowering of our collective unconscious. Let me tell you why. I will never be the man who's going to laugh about raping babies. Sorry. 
I'll never laugh about genital mutilation of young teenage girls. Sorry. I will never laugh at AIDS in Uganda. I'll never laugh at the fact that in, there are villages in Uganda, actual villages, where everybody has AIDS. So the only person you have sex with without AIDS is by raping a baby. Not funny to this guy. And I watched it, Pat Tatch's Theater, 2,000 people, mostly straight. And what I realized was every joke, or most of the jokes, not every, but every joke, is about the way gay people have sex, the way my community makes love. So the African tribe member comes out and goes, I'm Master Butt, F-U-C-K-E-R. And they die laughing. Every time he walks on stage, I'm Master Butt. And people are howling. The woman in front of me was slapping her knee, falling off the chair. And I'm like, OK, what's this really going on? What's, re what's this really about? And I get that they're Mormons and they're closeted. And my friends will say to me, even my gay friends, oh, it's South Park. You don't get it. I get it. I understand the humor. I get it. But what's really going on is they are making fun of the way men make love with men because it's sexist. It's linked to sexism. A man gets on top of a man, he penetrates him, he's on top of him, he's inserting himself, and in their eyes, it's a man becoming a woman. And it's degradation of women. I think it's completely sexist, and when you watch a play and you think, that's all they're laughing at. Every joke is about a penis being inserted in a man. So, let me contradict myself for a second. I think the best move, film or play ever written about women's oppression is A Woman Under the Influence by John Cassavetes. Now, he wrote that for Jenna Rollins, the great actress, his wife. And in that movie, she has to deal with the struggles of oppression of a woman, male entitlement, male privilege. So I rewatched the movie before this talk and thought, God, here's a straight man making a great feminist film. So can a non-gay woman or man make a great film or play? Possibly. I think it's possible, but I think it's rare. I don't think it's the norm. Now let me take us back to being the norm. It's a tricky thing. Because we strive for normalization, right? We strive for it. I'm turning 60. I'm not pushing it, I'm pulling it. <laughs> right here on my left shoulder. I'm turning 60, and I've been an activist and an actor for 40 years. And I was thinking, for four decades, I've been working and striving for the exact liberation that might be actually hurting my community in a very weird way, right? Fighting for all of that stuff that we want, that normalization, but could be eradicating our unique, beautiful, horrifying, and gorgeous voices. Now, Maya Angelou, who was not gay, but wrote a poem based on Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poem, The Mask, tied to her poem called The Mask. Now listen carefully to what she's saying. My fathers speak in voices that shred my fact and sound, but they say sugar. It was our submission that made your world go round. They laugh to conceal their crying. They shuffled through their dreams. They stepped and fetched the country and wrote the blues in screams. It could and did derive from living on the edge of death. That kept my race alive by wearing the mask. What she's saying speaks volumes to me and my community because we lived on the edge of death for so long and still do. I'm not safe in many countries, many cities. Now, trust me when I tell you this. Larry Kramer, he wrote The Normal Heart in Screams. Tony Kushner wrote Angel America, Living on the Edge of Death. When you grow up and the world tells you that the way you love is wrong, think about that. The way you love is wrong. So how does that affect your psyche? What does that do to a person? So when I'm talking about queer art, we are always, always, always talking about queer identity, not just queer experience. But the world is changing, right? Sometimes in good ways, not so good ways. And some young kids, queer kids, don't have to come out anymore. My friend sat her 14-year-old son down and said, I have to ask you, are you gay? And her son said, duh, mom, have you met me? And that was the extent of the conversation. That was it. 
Now that blows my mind and makes me so happy, but I live in LA, I don't live in Nebraska. Right. Right. But these young people are less outsiders than my previous generations. And what will that mean to the queer voice, the new young queer voice, the voice that, that Tim was talking about? Because I work with many programs in our youth uh, art programs, and these kids are sort of amazing. But they write short films, spoken word, poetry slams, plays. But the thing that's blown my mind and really excites me is they're always writing about, writing about their freedom, their freedom to be who they are. It's less about oppression, less about acceptance. It's more about this is who I am. One young woman I've worked with said to me in her, one of her things she was working on, I'm gonna slam dunk my queer spirit so loud and proud in your face that you can't turn away. I'm gonna slam dunk my queer spirit in a way that you cannot deny my identity. You cannot deny my queer spirit. I won't let you. That young woman, much closer to the norm that I ever was, but what fascinates me, what I wanna share with you is that the central force the central form of her artistic expression is still about being queer and being recognized and her identity. She and many, many other young people are gonna keep my race alive. Why? Because it was their submission that made your world go round. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Uh, so we have three respondents, and let's start with Emily. Would you like us to respond to sitting or sitting? What's that? Um, sitting. Oh, wait, sit, sit. Yeah. <clears throat> so that was wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you for all that, and you, you covered so much. Um, you know, I want to really focus in on, on the freedom, the freedom that you talk about, and representation. Um, I, I represent a statewide LGBT org, but I'm also a bisexual activist. And you talked a lot about the transgender community and, and how much it's being featured right now. And I, I think a lot of where there's overlap in representation of the queer community in the arts and who we are as the queer community and what we have be, become known for and celebrated for has to do with freedom, but seeking freedom in boxes. Mm -hmm. We have needed to get whatever access to our rights and our safety as we could find as soon as possible and be loved and find family. And we have had writers and artists find innovative ways to do that for us and make us charming and witty and relatable and familiar. And flawed. In a familiar way. Mm -hmm. But that means in a repetitive way, in a same way. Mm -hmm. We are the same. One of the wonderful things about the queer community, one of the things that is so spectacular and groundbreaking about the queer movement is we took gender and sexuality and we said, fuck it. Right. Mm -hmm. right, on. right on. We said it's not that simple. There is not an answer. There is not a box. It is not to love in spite of. It is to love regardless of. It is not that I am this and that means that I express myself with these characteristics, A, B, C, and D. It means that I am who I am. And that may look like all of these things and it's really unlikely to match up with this person next to me. I am authentic. Right, and if I can jump in, we brought sexual fluidity to the table. 
we said to the world is a spectrum of sexual fluid fluidity and we're gonna now say we belong anywhere in that spectrum. So do you, but we brought it to the table. Right, right. Yeah, and, and artists started, started to talk about that and, and that has been wonderful. And yet, now we also have this, this idea, and I say this as a bisexual, we have this idea that we have to fight against where in order to be understood and accepted, and in great part because we, we might not have the writers that are a part of our community creating our characters, and that's where I, I think that you really spoke to a powerful point there, that a lot of our freedom and a lot of the way that we can, we can have progress in our finding our freedom and having art as a way to, to make progress in the movement and, and not just as, as a statement and, and um, as entertainment, is making sure that our voices are both behind and in front of the camera. Um, but part of the problem is that, that we have others who are not us writing those roles and writing those roles in a way that make us easy to understand so that we have gay men who are, who are funny and feminine and better mothers than you will ever be. And that's the way it in, is in just about every, every TV show. And we have um, women who will be attracted to women and, and there is somebody who, who fits the masculine role and somebody who fits the feminine role and God forbid somebody is able to be attracted to, to more than one gender or that somebody doesn't fit the idea of what we think of as gender. It's just more complicated than that. Well, you know, you identify as a bisexual woman, which I really appreciate, and I cut this from my speech because I was trying to save time, um, but there's never anything ever done about bisexuals that I see. Yeah. There's a play called Cockfight that was in London and won the Olivier Award, and so it came to LA and I was dying to see it, mm -hmm. and I went with friends, and I looked at the playwright who won't, he won't identify his sexuality, which kind of annoys me, because what are you hiding? But it was a play about these two characters. The guy had to choose between a man and a woman. Choose the woman, choose the man. And that's not the bisexual community that I know and work with. And I thought this Herald play about bisexuals is about making this choice. And, that's, and I thought, even you got it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's not what the movement's about. Yeah, and, and often when we see portrayals of the, the trans community, and I say trans with an asterisk, when you see yeah. that, it means trans umbrella. It means, it means the whole gender spectrum. Um, then you see that somebody is transitioning from, um, from who the society has expected them to be to a specific gender mold. And what we're finding right now in the movement, in the community, is that we have a whole gender queer community who is saying, I am who I am. And people are expecting me to identify as either female or male, mm -hmm. feminine or masculine, including those in the trans community. They are saying that you are not legitimate. You have to transition to this or to this because that is how we are accepted now. And that is in great part because of our promotion and our creation and the way our story is told. Um, let me invite Curtis in. I am just so happy to be in this room because I feel I'm speaking to my brothers and sisters and John, thank you for this. So um, I'm Curtis and I identify myself as a member of the creative class. Although my day job calls me to be an administrator, fighting for rights, providing education advocacy um, here locally and statewide with a national presence, uh, I still think of myself as that uh, little boy who always wanted to design clothes. I was very fortunate being a graduate of Cass Technical High and a graduate of Parsons New School out of New York my dreams came true. And here I am, this 18-year-old in New York City with this dream, and this strange occurrence happened. This, this thing that came and started destroying gay men arrived. And I saw my community, my culture change. Now mind you, I was only a young person, when, and when I came out, I came out as a teenager, and when I came out, I saw the gay community as vibrant, lively, I, I mean, there were some, some of the most beautiful people, and I thought, if this is the gay, gay community, this is where I belong. Well, things changed, 
And so I saw my community die. Um, I saw my brothers and sisters on Broadway die first. And in the fashion world, we came right down the street on 7th Avenue. I saw my heroes, Perry Ellis, Willie Smith, die right before my eyes, Patrick Kelly. And soon later, I saw my friends pass away. And when I thought about um, this subject of assimilation, I saw my community change um, from this sexy, vibrant, sometimes tacky community to this new community that wore chambray shirts and khaki pants. And I have to admit, I became one of those people. I necessarily did not want to run away from gay culture, but I definitely <clears throat> wanted to live, right? Though I wasn't so involved in the gay activism when I was younger, it wasn't until my best friend died in my arms that I decided to then give my life to providing a service for others who wouldn't have to go through the pain that I went through. Times have changed. For those who are black and brown, HIV is rampant and it is bad. And so I definitely want to create spaces so that people can tell their stories about community. One of the things that I have done, which I'm very proud about, is um, develop this nonprofit that is pretty much ran by people under 30. So I'm the old man in the room. And uh, I was able to form this um, fundraiser that was a pop, rock, and soul review. I've always wanted to produce, and I have no artistic background in that. But I consider myself a Broadway baby. I'm that classic gay that always sings show tunes, you know, those showboat and all those songs, right? And so I said, come on, let's put on the shows in that same Mickey and Judy kind of thing. And in downtown Detroit for five years, we had this program where uh, gay men sang the love songs performed by women, and women sang love songs performed by men in a three-part act. And we tore the roof down. Uh, so there was some time for enjoyment, but I, I say to you that um, I'm very happy that there are some of us who um, think forward and who push us and who are able to express themselves, and uh, I welcome and salute that. Carlos. Is this on? Yeah, this is on. Um, well, I've... So happy to be here. I'm Carlos, everybody. I play the cello in the Catalyst Quartet. And I'm here primarily for the Sphinx competition, which is happening uh, today and tomorrow and the next day. Um, but I'm very pleased and honored to be a part of this discussion. And I've really enjoyed hearing what all of you have to say. Um, at the same time, I am a little confused because I don't understand what we're really saying. Um, I think we're speaking about experience and we're speaking about um, you know, the things that we're doing that are important and that I believe are really important and speaking about, um, you know, representation of, you know, art, which you know, we're all, you know, artists in, in some respect. Um, but when I think about compassionate human beings and when I think about what it is um, to sort of be a good person, inevitably I think about uh, people needing to relate to one another and needing to share experience. So um, we can't really reach a level, I believe, of full inclusion in uh, any society without that sort of um, dance that you have to do with people that are outside of your experience and um, people that are inside of your experience uh, relating to one another and sharing each other's stories and being a part of each other's communities. Um, so I think maybe what I'm sort of trying to understand here and what I've gathered. I mean, I work a lot in the theater community in New York um, as a musician. I have lots of friends who are actors. Uh, I work in you know, some film, television industry stuff. And I see it and I know some of these writers. And I think, you know, what I would like to see happen um, based on what you had to say, which I think was terrific, was I think we need to find a way to um, balance uh, the sort of platform that we're dealing with here. Because I don't want to um, say, oh, well, queer people can't do uh, queer, you know? And because then we would have to flip the coin over and say, well, then we can't do straight either. And I think that that's cutting ourselves short in a way. Um, 
and I do agree with people telling their stories outright. And I think, you know, Transparent, you mentioned, is doing an amazing job um, and a compassionate job of bringing large-scale understanding to a trans community. Um, and there's a lot of straight actors on that show. But, but the reason why that is is because Jill Salloway, her father, came out as a trans man, um, I think it was like late 50s, early 60s. Mm -hmm. And when Jill began that process, the entire crew, down to craft service, had to be getting trans 101 training. Mm -hmm, right. She made both bathrooms mm -hmm. unisex. She hired tons of trans mm -hmm. writers and trans actors. Mm -hmm. So she's telling her specific story about yeah. her dad. Mm -hmm. So it's her story. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you an example. If you look at Will and Grace, which was created by a gay man and was doing really interesting work, as the show went on and they lost gay writers, you have an episode where Jack meets Demi Moore, who played his was his babysitter, and he sees her in a coffee shop and wants her to come over and babysit him. And he gets in feety pajamas and she babysits him. And I'm screaming, it's, that's a minstrel show to me. I mean, I don't know any gay man who wants to get with his babysitter and act like he's a baby, but by the end of that show, as they lost their good writers and their gay writers, mm. that character became so offensive, he was unwatchable. Mm. Even Modern Family, which I really like, and I know some of the writers in that show, the gay couple don't talk to each other. Mm. They're just answering gay quips. It's all these gay quips, mm. and you watch the other two couples, who, uh, families rather, who have conversations. Mm -hmm. But they've been reduced now to just these sort of funny gay one-liners. Mm -hmm. And I hear yeah. that, I hear that. And I think basically um, my takeaway from being here right now in this conversation is what can we do? What are the solutions? What are the ways we can move forward? Rather than speak about um, experience and opinion and the things that we're seeing, what can we do to sort of find a way to produce and support these voices well, um, that, that actually, you know, speak to our own community, where at the same time can invite people from other communities into what we are about in a, in a really healthy and inclusive way that um, then we can share and grow together as a larger group. Yeah, well, that, um, so what was, can we do? That was, do? My, that was my response, response, and that's why I brought up that show. Um, though that was our attempt to enter um, some kind of form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. We created this kind of space where gay and lesbian and bi trans artists, particularly singers, musicians, poets, can express themselves. I am so interested in creating experiences, right? I am not, I'm not a writer, I'm not really interested in working for someone, but I am interested in creating. And so instead of me um, saying, well, I want you to create this change for, to create this change for me, we're going to create it. Right? And mm -hmm. so we created this space, this very unique space that lasted again for five years so that we can, we can tell the story. Uh, so that's one yeah. way yeah. I, I would recommend. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like we've identified two things here. The queer arts community supporting itself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and that can be done with resources, that can be done with, with gatherings and, and building up the queer arts movement right. and community and, and probably helping to develop those skills and, and promote that work and, and help each other get jobs, and, and also making sure that queer stories are told by queer people so that queer representation is accurate and, and exhibit multi-dimensional human beings that don't leave us with one image that ends up being a caricature. And much back to what you said, which I agree with, and helping the non-queer person who wants to write that story, don't call me and tell me you've got a script that you wrote about a transgender person and you interviewed three trans people and you know that story. You don't. And it's the same story over and over again. And I get that phone call endlessly. Oh, I, I interviewed three trans people. Right. And, then, and I just want to expand with Emily's point about getting jobs. I am so into making sure that art is paid for. Mm -hmm. right? I am the first to ask, what, what are you worth? And how are we going to get those funds to pay you for that work? And so, uh, yes, um, you can't just ask somebody to just sing a song and just expect them to go. That art mm -hmm. should be appreciated. So you're right about finding um, employment opportunities, finding resources, making sure that our stories are told in the way that we want them to be told um, authentically. Let's, uh, let's invite the audience in. Nicely summed up those two uh, th uh, threads. And the question that was plopped out for us, what are the ways to move forward? I know I keep hearing a conversation around uh, sort of tensions between two different poles and a question about authenticity. 
uh, the word, a number of times the word has come up, which for a brief etymology break, uh, etymologically the word authentic means self-made, coming from the self. So let me open it up to comments of colleagues to answer that question maybe about what are the ways we move forward or perhaps a thought about Emily's two different strands of, of moving forward. There's a hand, yes. Uh, if you would stand up, and here comes your mic. Oh, you were stretching, oh my god. Here we got one, that's a legitimate hand, and this will be the next hand. Hi everyone, and, and great panel. The first couple of heads, this is just uh, you know, f exactly the type of conversation we wanted to to build, and as I was hearing this kind of dialogue around authenticity, I was thinking from the music perspective and thinking about some of the ways in which some composers, say like Gershwin, have been celebrated, but in many ways were depicting a culture that wasn't necessarily their own. So a, a white Jewish composer, but reflecting really black American culture in some ways, and where in some ways it's celebrated, but in other ways criticized, and other composers of the time, and you think about what happened to their works and compositions that weren't necessarily as widely disseminated. And I wanted to, I don't necessarily have an answer to the question, but I wanted to kind of share that in music there is this similarity, and that at least in my own personal experiences, that I'm loath to to cast aside a work, an artistic work that speaks to me because it wasn't necessarily created by someone who actually comes from whatever the culture that might be reflected in the artistic work. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, from an intellectual point of view and from just, I guess, a cultural pride point of view, I do want the stories of my community told by, and I feel like they're more authentic in that way, but I also don't want to kind of back away from being totally moved when someone kind of captures it or when someone with an incredible craft can somehow, because of their own life exposure to my community, is able to speak about that experience. And so I think there is value there, and maybe I, that leads I me think, in the middle. I think, Aaron, that's really interesting, and especially when you speak of, about the musical front, when you talk about the great operas that we have um, in the repertoire, um, you know, another example of storytelling, musical storytelling, you know, the most performed opera on the planet is Carmen, and it's about Spanish culture mm -hmm. written by a Frenchman um, who, I, you know, I don't think he'd visited Spain by the time he wrote Carmen, and it's the most celebrated, you know, thing that we have in the operatic, you know, repertoire. Mm -hmm. Not to mention Puccini, an Italian composer writing about um, China, writing Turandot. Mm -hmm. And Madame Butterfly writing about Jap about Japan. So you know, sometimes when you get it right, I think it's it's a great thing, and it's, it can right. be a good thing as long as there's a way to support both sides of it. it here's what I want to say to everybody in this room, because we have lots of musicians in this room, right? Lots of people who are musicians, composers. You practice a lot. You do not. You practice a great deal to do your art as a musician, right? right? So what I'm saying is this. You want to write a story, and you're more than welcome to, that is about a queer person. You just don't interview three people. Delve into it. Spend time. Get in that community. Learn it. The way you all, because the thing that's the oddest thing about actors and writers, are, you know, musician, you have to study forever, right? Want to get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, right? The, the, the old saying. So you spend years and years and years practicing your craft to get it right, to honor your craft. That's what I'm saying. If you want to write a story that's not from you, then spend the time really learning what that community is. It's not just two or three interviews for an hour, and boom, you're done. That's what, I, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, yes, question here. Hi, uh, mine is a question coming out of this, is when we start talking about community, is there a way to talk about community that's not exclusionary? Right. That that we're talking about how uh, the queer community has sort of been assimilated, but we still talk about the queer community. I think it goes across this whole conversation as to how do we become not exclusionary as we start defining those smaller communities we're talking about? Inclusion. I, and you have to be intentional about it. Yeah. You have to step out of your comfort zone. I always say that whenever I'm comfortable, I'm not progressing. 
I have to stay uncomfortable. I got to get to know different types of people within our community. So that means going to, being the only man at a lesbian party, being the only man at a transgender party, being the oldest man at a youth party sometime. Uh, that's how we can normalize and expand our community so it isn't just a male community, a, a women's community, or just youth community. So you have to be intentional and, and be okay with being uncomfortable. But with all due respect, the word of inclusion is coming from somebody who's never been an outsider, who is a white male in this society. So yes, absolutely, I believe in inclusion totally, but when people talk about inclusion, you've got to understand that Who's if, never been an outsider? Uh, I'm sorry? Who's never been an outsider? You... Well, I'm saying like, you know, a, a straight wild, white male in the society has never been really an outsider. Okay. Are you referring to me? No, I'm oh, just, okay. no, 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 not to you. <laughs> I used inclusion too. Yeah, oh, I'm just saying, yeah. but no, the word, when I do a talk, the word yeah. inclusion comes usually from somebody who is a straight white yeah. male. I'm assuming, I mean, I mean, I'm making a large assumption here, but it's the broader conversation. So in that perspective, you, you know, the inclusion story comes people who have not been the outsider. So being the outsider, which created my art form or the art form of my community, you have to understand where that art form came from mm. and really understand before you start talking about inclusion because inclusion's always been something you've had, yeah. if that makes sense. I'm not sure if I'm making, if I'm making sense. Question, yes. Hi, my name's Bly. I'm, a, I'm actually a music therapist locally here. And this actually just uh, brought to mind a study that um, uh, some colleagues of mine are doing, um, and I, without giving too much away since it's not my work and it hasn't been published yet, but it is a study on the music therapy community's knowledge of uh, queer issues and even of am I working with queer individuals? Because anecdotally, the authors felt like so many times they hear, oh, I, I don't have to worry about that. I work with geriatrics, or I work with children, and not mutually exclusive, you know, so recognizing not putting people in boxes. Um, and so that's just really what resonated uh, with me is, is thinking about um, recognizing, because that's a big part of what music therapy is, is allowing people to tell their own stories. So if you know, you're working in a group of senior citizens and it's around Valentine's Day and you're focusing on let me call you sweetheart or all of these other things, what is that going to mean to each individual and how do we let people express that in a supportive relationship? How do we let children express what they're learning about love and relationship and connectedness in a supportive environment and just not putting people into boxes? So. That should be coming out soon, if any of you are interested. I know they're hoping to publish very, very soon, but. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Rihanna. Um, Curtis is my boss. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that expression and music and art from the queer community exists. It exists and it exists in a multitude of forms. It's just that we have to amplify it. So when you find a YouTube artist, you know, share. So because a lot of people use social media as a as their platform because they don't have the access. So we we didn't even address access in the conversation because access is a big issue to the art. So accessing art, and a lot of people use alternative methods of um, expression, expressing and you know, displaying their art because they don't have a way to get to Carnegie Hall. <laughs> they don't have, you know, they might not even know Carnegie Hall exists. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's important that we think about, um, there are people making art and maybe it's about us finding them and pulling them in. Yeah, and I would say the joy, the joy to what you're saying is that there are young people today who make their art and put it on YouTube. I mean, they, they have an access, accessibility to their art that we've never had before. Right. So I think we're able to see and hear voices. You can make a movie now, you know, with, with your own camera. But the amount of stuff that's hitting the internet and hitting all kinds of social media that are really interesting, amazing young voices that we would never see. I was also struck, John, earlier when you were talking about the young voices that you hear, the kind of uh, um, authority and clarity 
and confidence in those young voices, it may be what we're partly looking at is this sort of transitional time from the paradoxical tensions you've experienced in your time to this uh, a, a kind of wider access, strong voice, multi-platform way to express uh, a next generation? I think in a way, um, looking forward, trying to find solutions, um, trying to innovate the way we talk about these things, um, supporting and spreading these voices will hopefully help the person who's trying to write a queer play, who really believes and, and wants to do a good job, but can only find three people to interview. Right. Can only, uh, has such a limited uh, place to look from, to draw from, their, you know, to write their story. And the more that we are visible, um, the more that, you know, the more access they'll have to information, hopefully. And I think the other part about information when it comes from your own specific community is that the information that you put out there is good, is positive, mm -hmm. um, reflects your experience, your people, the way you want it to, um, the way you want it to be viewed, seen, digested. Um, so that's, I think, yeah, how I feel we, about We produce that. A, a Latino queer arts and film festival, four days of visual art films, music, uh, all kinds of stuff. It goes on for four days. It's a huge uh, part of my job. And it's all young people who are around 30 and under. Um, some of them are straight, all, all are welcome. But the way these young people work, and none of them are being paid. These are all people who just love queer art and mostly film. Yeah. I, I'm astounded at their commitment. They work like it's a full-time job. And there's something about their need to express art that I didn't see with my generation. Right. And I think a lot of that comes from technology. But uh, if they're the next generation, I got a lot of hope. Yeah. A lot of hope. That's great. Uh, Curtis, any comment? A student of yours just spoke up. <laughs> any thought there? Well, she is part of my inspiration. So I am surrounded by talented young people. And that what leads me to, to say again what I shared earlier about the need for someone like me, a man who considers himself to be a member of the creative class, to be a funder of the arts. And so it is very important that I own my words. I, you know, I can't, uh, I'm not as talented as Rihanna. She's a, a photographer and a poet. And uh, so many people that I'm around. But for me, it's about finding the resources to hire you. Right, so that our stories do not disappear. As I said earlier, I experienced uh, uh, our movement assimilating, right? And we dumbed down our expression. I want to say it's probably in the mid 90s. And then I saw the youth movement just um, take on our culture, and I saw a, a, a vibrant community again. And so I am also hopeful for um, Rihanna and all of the people like her contribute to the movement. Uh, I don't want them to assimilate. But I need to provide them the tools so that happens. And when I say I, I mean the arts community. So to the donor, to um, uh, individual funder, it's saying I want this to occur and what can I do to make that happen? Yeah. It's, it's so important. I mean, I can't, you can't talk about art without talking about funding it, right? right? And if I want to hear this kind of a voice or this kind of a art, I gotta make sure it exists somehow. Yeah. And, and I spend most of my time in the administrative seat. In, in doing that work and letting them uh, Just one more thing I want to point out. John's example of the Young uh, Latino Arts Festival in a LA sort of answers your question about uh, opening up the community, that in fact young straight Latinos want to be a part of that event because of the intrinsically motivated passion just to make this thing happen. So that's a real answer to the question of how do we expand the inclusivity of queer communities. Other questions? We're getting short on time. Observations? Yes. How you doing? So, up, oh, up. I gotta stand up, huh? <laughs> uh, I'm David. Um, so I wanted to touch on the creating the change for the youth. Um, I want to say the, the grant or the funding part from the last panel, that should be a real big key in multicultural uh, uh, and diversity inclusion for the music or the arts. Um, my experience as a black gay man is gonna be different from a Latino gay man and everything, well, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, but our youth, we should invest in the youth. Like Youthville, um, 
they have a new name now on Woodward and West Grand Boulevard. But they used, they used to have a center and a whole studio where you can come in and make your music, make your songs, create a show, anything like that. So I think we should make more spaces and create more spaces like that to inform other people on the LGBT community or queer community, rather. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something fa fascinating. We got a grant, somebody came to us with a grant and said, we have a grant and we asked these young people, you can do anything with art, this was this grant, anything mm -hmm. you want, what do you want to do? And they want to do production of the normal heart. And they came to us and said, can we do it with you guys? And I said, under one condition, what we have to do is every single part of that production, costumes, props, director, actor, everybody has to have a mentor. So mm -hmm. I knew enough people, and I said, okay, you're my, and a mentor, these were all young, young people, but we had a mentor for two months who said, okay, I'm a costume designer, here's how you do costumes, here's how you do props, lights, sound, and the end result of that was they came out of this with all this experience from seasoned people who know how to do this stuff, and it was remarkable because their production was extraordinary, mm -hmm. and to be honest, way better than I thought they would ever do with this really difficult, complex play but they were mentored in every single aspect. And I think that aspect of putting into grants, it's easy to get mentors. Enough, if you're in the theater, you know enough people who do what you do. Mm -hmm. And they're not young, they're usually, my, they're usually my age. So put a mentor component into that and make that mandatory. Teach, teach the, the next teachers. Um, you're reminding me or uh, bringing to mind again another answer to your question that may be a, a habit of mind we want to think about taking away is that in terms of opening up queer community it is to to welcome in the non-queer but with a, a deep commitment to the respect for the the, the depth mm -hmm. and the knowing that is contained in being queer so if in fact you choose to engage with that uh, community there, we need to make sure that deep and respectful communication happens so that none of the uh, casual or, or insulting uh, traditions that, or, or uh, expressions that happen sometimes happen under our watch. On both sides of the conversation. On both sides of the sure. conversation. And so creating safe spaces, right, and being true to that and being very intentional in maintaining those safe yep. spaces so that that can occur. Uh, we are at the end of our time. Uh, we can cheat just 30 seconds if anybody has a closing comment that must be said. Some final thought you didn't have a chance to say but want to offer to this? Going once. Well, I, I mean, I, I encourage multiculturalism. I think that's a good thing, as I've heard earlier. Um, I just urge that my gay, lesbian, bi, transgendered uh, members of the creative class take as many opportunities as you can so that you can express yourself and uh, continue culturally um, expanding who we are. Last word, Emily. Yeah, I would say every, we're all in this room because we acknowledge the power of the arts. And despite the fact that I'm not an artist, when, when a newspaper reporter calls and, and says, I want to speak to a trans person so that I can understand the trans experience, I say, no, here are four people. Right. because I need you to see what it is for, for an older trans woman who has had these opportunities and also a, a trans man who, who has not. And this college professor, queer person, who, um, gender queer person, who is now sleeping on couches because they can't find a job. Because art has power, there is social responsibility, or I would like us to think of it as such, because there is so much power. And, and take that the next step of making sure there is that diversity of experience that's represented because there will be an impact. Well said. I just want to thank you all and just express my gratitude that this conversation is even happening yeah. and yes. that we're talking about these things and that they're part of, of what we're dealing with now. Yeah. And thank you for your time, folks. I so appreciate it. Yeah. Well, and thank you to our panel.